uh, CPC Train Canada is a 23-year-old Canadian company. Uh, we have 11 locations nationally in Canada. Uh, we are an IBM partner and uh, among other partners. Uh, so if you guys have any c questions, again, uh, send them through the chat. And I'm going to pass it over to our instructor, Stephen DeBaron uh, from IBM, and for his presentation on VMware. OK, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to the uh, VMware Education with um, IBM and CTC. Uh, my name is Stephen DeBarrows, and uh, I'm going to be your instructor for this little lunch and learn that we have. Uh, a little bit of about, about a bit about myself. I'm actually an IBM employee with IBM Canada. I'm actually the lead instructor for VMware in Canada and uh, for IBM, obviously. And I also teach various server certification courses, SAN courses, and a whole whack load of stuff related to servers. So I'm a real server guy when it comes down to it. Um, this session here is what we're going to do is we're going to basically go through and give you a little bit of background information on what virtualization is if you're kind of new to it. We'll talk about the importance of virtualization and we'll also offer some, um, we'll show you what courses are being offered through CTC as well to help you get up to speed or your customers to get up to speed on certification. So why don't we uh, get going here. So the first thing I have on my little list here is virtualization 101. So uh, this is basically the, the first step for, is understanding virtualization. So it says, what is virtualization? It says here it's technology for uh, partitioning one physical server into multiple virtual servers. Uh, how I like to look at this is virtualization is we're creating a computer using software, right? So this computer is just a bunch of files, which we'll talk about, right? So that's kind of neat. We're actually, it's sort of like me building a real machine. I would buy the system board, put in so much memory, put in a hard drive, put in a video adapter, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm now doing it all through software. Now, each virtual machine or virtual computer runs its own operating system, uh, runs its own set of applications, and are completely isolated from other virtual machines. So I can have one VM running Linux, let's say, and another one running um, you know, Windows. It doesn't really matter. If one of the machines crashes, it does not affect the other. So they're completely isolated. Virtualization is not a simulation. It's not an emulator. We're not simulating processors or emulating processors and stuff. So there's a big difference there. And we can see in this little picture, we've got our physical server down here at the bottom. This is what we call our host. And then we have our virtual machines running on top of it. So kind of just a, a little quick picture on that. So what is a virtual machine? It says it's a software platform like a physical computer runs an operating system and application. So what I tell my students in my classroom is treat your virtual machines like you would a physical machine. So you would back it up normally. You would protect it with antivirus software, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now that it's a virtual machine, there's actually some benefits to it, right? Um, most people, once they start playing with virtualization, they realize that virtual machines are much easier to manage and protect than physical machines are. Uh, for example, uh, a little while back, I was, um, I was actually out in Montreal, and I had a problem with my laptop. It actually had a little meltdown. So I basically started scrambling, had to find a recovery CD, et cetera, et cetera. But long story short, if I virtualized my laptop and it was just an image, because it's just a b bunch of files, that's what a virtual machine is, I could have just taken that and run it on um, any other machine kind of thing with like, let's say, VMware Player kind of thing, right? So I'm in the process of actually virtualizing my laptop right now. Um, it says virtual machine is a discrete set of files. Uh, and the main files being the config file, the virtual disk file, log files, and there's a whole whack load of them. And again, in the courses that we covered, the, uh, there's the, the first course which we'll actually talk about is the install, configure, and manage course. That's kind of the, the very first course most people will take. And we actually go through talking about what a virtual machine is. We talk about all the files that make up a virtual machine. So that's fairly important. The main file here is the virtual disk file. So that could actually be fairly large. So if I give a virtual machine, let's say, a 100 gig virtual disk, by default, that file would generally be about 100 gig in size. But it can be smaller. Uh, again, we've got this thing called thin formatting, thin provisioning, uh, which we talk about in the class. 
So a virtual machine is just a bunch of files and just treat your virtual machine like you would a real computer. Okay. This slide here I kind of like because this shows us the old ways, uh, the old way of doing things. We have our physical infrastructure. Back in the old days, we'd have our physical servers. That's what this little box is down over here in the bottom of the gray, right? So you might have a, an enterprise customer. They might have thousands of these servers. You know, these could be DNS servers, mail servers, web servers, database servers, whole whack load of them, right? Each server then has an operating system installed on top of it. So maybe it's Windows or Linux or Novell or whatever the case may be. And then each server would generally typically have an application installed on top of that. Again, it could be a database server, DNS servers, web servers, etc. I really don't care too much about that. Now, if we notice here, again, this is the old way of doing things. We may have thousands of these machines. These machines are typically uh, hooked up to what we call a storage area network, and that's what we're seeing over here in this little cloud. Uh, so we've got our good old blue connection. So this could be a, a fiber channel connection to a SAN. So this is the back-end network for the storage for the server. So some of them may be connected like that. Then your servers will typically be hooked up to an Ethernet network, and that's what we're seeing over here. That's what the black connection is showing us. Uh, this Ethernet network allows our engine, now we don't see it in the diagram, but it allows our clients to talk to these machines and, and stuff. So this is kind of the old way of doing things. The new way of doing things, if I go forward one slide, we still have sort of the same kind of uh, layout, but we have a lot less machines. So here we have our physical servers. On top of our physical servers, we have this thing, what we call the hypervisor, right? This is what, again, since we're talking about VMware, this would be typically ESXi that's installed. So the hypervisor is basically the magic that allows us to create virtual machines. And we see we got virtual machines running on top of these servers. These servers, again, are typically hooked up to some kind of SAN. So we, so we have a storage over here, a storage area network. And then these uh, physical machines are also connected to a network. Uh, this network allows, again, typically end users to access the virtual machines and stuff. Again, this is a very oversimplified diagram, okay? Um, so the advantage of a virtual infrastructure that we can see right off the bat is less servers. Now, if I go back one slide, so this is the old way of doing things, right? So if you're an enterprise customer, let's say you've got, you know, thousands of machines in your environment, if you actually monitor the utilization of those machines over a period of time, you'll probably find that your utilization is somewhere probably around 10% utilized. Actually, that's a high number. It would probably be a lot less than that, probably 8% utilized. So when uh, we look at this, we're not getting a real good uh, return on our investment because we're not really utilizing the full capabilities of these machines. And, and servers today are so powerful. Processors are so powerful. We've got tons of memory. They're so fast. It's almost wasteful today to buy a server, install an operating system on it, and have it do one thing and one thing only. Most of the times that this does not it doesn't make sense because you're not getting a good return on your investment. Now we go back into the new way of doing things in a virtual environment. Again, we have our physical servers. We have a lot less of them. So we actually can now get better utilization out of these machines. So it's a much better return on our investment. We have less servers, therefore less real estate. So it takes up less space. Real estate's expensive. It costs money to make a data center. Less servers, therefore less power we're consuming. Everybody's concerned about power, right? Eh? Uh, also, less servers, less heat we're generating, therefore less cooling requirements, therefore less power. Again, so these are the big things that uh, customers see today, enterprise environments see today uh, in virtualization. And the main benefits is they're saving tons and tons of money on space and data centers and, and also making things a lot easier to manage. Okay. If I go forward to another slide here, so we're on resource sharing. So the one of the things with virtualization, I said that we're going to potentially get a better return on our investment because now we can actually have these virtual machines, and that's what we're seeing here in this little picture here. They've got three virtual machines They're running on top of one physical box, and that's kind of what we see here. Um, this physical box is what we call our host system, and the virtual machines is what we call our guests. Now, one of the things here is these VMs, are now sharing our resources. So we see over here we have our physical CPU and physical memory and network and disk inside our physical server. Um, so there's advantages to that. Obviously, we're sharing, we're getting better return on our investment. 
Uh, the other side of the coin, too, there's some disadvantages to that because potentially virtual machines can now uh, start competing for these resources, especially if we overcommitted them and we don't have enough processors, let's say, or enough memory inside our box, then that could impact the performance of these VMs. And that's one of the things, again, I like to talk about in our course, uh, in one of the courses anyways, the Install, Configure, and Manage course. We talk to the students about this. We basically show them the importance of uh, how to manage your resources, how to prevent virtual machines from um, consuming too much of a particular resource, how to prioritize virtual machines, all that kind of stuff we do talk about. That's very important, obviously, because you know we don't really want to run into issues. Uh, okay. Well, the next slide says, uh, how does virtualization work? It says, allows multiple operating system instances to run concurrently within virtual machines on a single computer. So again, we see we have our single host machine with our hardware. And in this picture, we actually have uh, two individual uh, virtual machines. Uh, again, they talk about a virtualization layer. It says, a virtualization layer is installed, which uses either a hosted or hypervisor architecture. So this is what we call our hypervisor. Basically, it sits right on top of our physical hardware uh, in this uh, particular situation. Uh, we'll notice also each virtual machine gets their own little virtual hardware. So virtual CPU, memory, disk, uh, disk, and then network. Right? And again, we can control all that when we're building our VMs. We can specify how many processors we have and how much memory the VM has, etc. So I kind of like this slide here. This kind of compares the differences between virtual machines and physical machines. So it talks a bit about the advantages. And, and, and some people know some of this stuff already, but some there's a few things that they may not be aware of. For example, when I look at a physical machine, the first thing it says, physical machines are difficult to move or copy. And I agree with that. Uh, when I have a physical machine in my, let's say, my classroom, if I need to send that physical machine out to Vancouver somewhere, and um, by the way, I'm located in Markham, uh, then I need to get to that physical machine, I have to shut it down, un, you know, unplug it, pack it up, bring it to our shipping department, have it shipped out to Vancouver, have somebody in Vancouver receive it, unpack it, and set it up. So again, uh, that's you know, what, that's what do you mean by it's difficult? It's also difficult to copy too. What they mean by that is, um, it's there's no built-in cloning technology inside the actual physical box. I'd have to use some kind of third-party ghosting software or whatever the case may be. Physical machines are bound to a specific set of hardware. And this is what I like to point out in my classroom. Now, I, I usually use Windows as an example, but I'm not just picking on Windows alone. But let's say I have uh, a computer. Let's say it's a, you know, I, I've got a server over here, and it's got Windows running on top of it. And, and I walk up to that machine, and I say, well, you know what? I don't want to have this um, adapt text uh, disk controller anymore. So I shut it down, and I remove the disk controller, and then I put in maybe a bus logic disk controller, so a different one, right? But when I turn the machine off, for those of you that have tried this, Windows will complain. It will blue screen and say, sorry, inaccessible boot device. What it's basically telling me, it's looking for that particular card that it was configured with. So again, there's ways around that. Not quite as easy, but again, there are ways around it. Um, but we'll talk about virtualization while we don't really worry too much about that. Physical machines typically also have a short life cycle. Usually you uh, lease them or, um, you know, three years, five years, then they're basically gone, and hopefully they're not left in landfill, to be honest with you. Physical machines require personal contact to upgrade the hardware, and I agree with that. Um, again, if I've got a physical machine here and I need to add more memory, i got to go to that box, shut it down, open up the covers, and install my memory dims, etc. Now, um, I know like in a classroom environment, uh, that can actually uh, be pretty intense because um, uh, let's say for example, you know, you've got hundreds of PCs and uh, all of a sudden now you need to upgrade all of them to whatever, you know, 8 gigs of RAM. Somebody's got to go out to each machine and do this. And if they were virtualized, it'd be a lot easier to do. Physical machines are uh, difficult to manage remotely. And what do they mean by that? Um, one a good example of that would be, I, I know HP has their ILO adapter, IBM's, we have our RSA cards and IMM's, Dell has their DRAC. These are special adapters or chips that are inside the server that allow me to remotely turn the machine off and on and do all kinds of neat stuff remotely. I can even have the remote video, all that, remote keyboard presence, the whole bit. Now, back in the old days, that wasn't the case. Okay? And a lot of servers don't come with that type of technology by default. 
right? So if we're not using that type of technology, that's what they mean here. It's difficult to manage remotely. Uh, you might be able to enable remote desktop, but if you turn off that machine accidentally, somebody's got to physically be there to turn it on, unless, again, you've got these special chips or cards inside them. Okay, now let's jump over to virtual machines. Virtual machines are easy to move and copy. As I mentioned before, virtual machines are just a bunch of files. That's all it is. Uh, I actually do a lot of uh, work on our lab environments. We have um, a lab in, in Canada. We have uh, another lab also in Montpellier, France. I, I do a lot of work on the images that we actually use to teach classes. And um, one of the things is um, I actually create the virtual machines uh, in my house. I actually have a Blade Center environment in my basement. Yes, I know Blade Center, but uh, I try to keep it off as much as I can, only when I'm working. Um, but what I do is I actually create my virtual machines in my environment, and then once um, I've got everything set up the way I want it, I compress it, and I basically dump it up to an FTP server. And then from that FTP server, I can go and grab those files from whatever lab location I'm working on. Maybe I'm working in the France lab. Maybe I'm working in the Canadian lab, or whatever the case may be. So it's easy for me, basically, to upload this stuff and then pull it to whatever environment that I needed it. Now, obviously, it takes a little while for me to upload it. I don't have this massive internet connection in my house, but I'll usually do this in the evenings kind of thing. So it does save me a lot of time. Unfortunately, because of this, IBM won't fly, fly me to France. But anyways, that's one of the downsides. So really cool, it's encapsulated in the files. Virtual machines are independent of physical hardware. So we see in this picture here, we have our physical server. That's what I'm pointing to right now. That's what we call our host system. Then we have our virtual machines that are sitting on top or running on top of this host machine. And what they're saying is it's independent of physical hardware. If this host machine, let's say, had um, let's say some Intel gigabit network cards, and let's say... Um, I want to get rid of the Intel gigabits, and I'm going to put in Broadcoms for whatever my reasons are, right? So I rip out all the Intels, pop in all my Broadcoms, and then at that point, once I configure this host for the Broadcom, these virtual machines can actually start utilizing them. I do not need to go inside each of the VM and replace the vice drivers. Why? Because each of the VMs get virtual hardware. They don't care about the physical hardware. Okay. Uh, another good example of this is I could create some virtual machines at home on my blade servers. They're IBM HS21 blades. These are basically Intel, Intel server blades with Broadcom Gigabit Ethernet. I could create a VM on my server at home, and I could give it to you, let's say, and you could run it on your machine in your environment. Maybe you have a Dell machine with, with Intel cards and AMD processors, right? And it won't run fine because everything is isolated from Virtual machines are easy to manage. Uh, they are isolated from other virtual machines running on the same hardware. As I mentioned before, if this VM blue screens or crashes or panics, depending on what OS you're running, it doesn't affect the other ones. And again, they are isolated from physical hardware changes, which I've mentioned already. So again, I could change the hardware here. I could actually take this VM and put it on a different physical box. All right? Okay. So some major advantages to virtualization. And one of the things that I always like to say, uh, as I mentioned before, when you get into virtualization and you start getting the hang of it, you'll find it's a lot easier to create and manage virtual machines than it does physical boxes. I know, for example, if I, if I create my uh, virtual machines, I can have Windows installed inside a VM in about 15 minutes or less. In the real world, on a real server, that's usually closer to an hour, to be honest with you. So big, big differences. The next uh, slide here talks about the advantages of the virtualization. It's sort of kind of a recap of what I just talked about. So again, reduced physical number of servers, right? I've mentioned that before. So reducing the servers reduces the power consumption, therefore saving money on hydro, reduces real estate uh, spaces, so you don't have to have as much of a massive data center, uh, reduces um, heat, and therefore saving you on cooling. Uh, reduces total cost of ownership. Improved uh, availability and business continuity. One of the big advantages of virtualization is, as I keep on preaching, uh, virtual machines are easier to protect than physical machines are. So while there are some solutions from VMware, one of them is called the VMware HA or high availability. So if a physical host blows up on me, uh, those VMs would fail over to another surviving host in a cluster. And again, we talk about that in our install, configure, and manage course. Increased IT efficiency, again, easier to manage the stuff. So technically, 
you don't need as many IT guys as you have right now. So I know that might be a bit of sore, a sore point for some of you, but that's kind of the reality of it. Um, and increased efficiency for development and test environment. Virtualization, really great for test and development environment. I actually get a lot of um, my uh, students in my classroom are uh, IBM software developers, and they basically do everything on virtual machines, so it saves a lot of money there. So that was virtualization. Now, what is vSphere? Okay, so VMware has their their enterprise product, which is called vSphere. Right? Uh, vSphere it says it's a software suite for optimizing and managing IT environments through virtualization. So basically, vSphere is a collection of services and solutions and software that allow us to do virtualization in our environment. So for example, the first little bullet here is VMware ESXi. This is the thing I was talking about. This is our hypervisor. Okay? So this is VMware's enterprise class virtualization. So this is the hypervisor that we install in our physical box and our virtual machines run on top of that. It also has this thing called virtual SMP. This is symmetrical multi-processing. That's the ability to give virtual machines multiple virtual CPUs. VMware high availability, again, all this stuff comes with the uh, vSphere suite. Uh, again, it wants your license appropriately for it, uh, but high availability allows us to protect our VMs in case of physical host fails. One of the things a lot of people, especially when virtualization first came out, uh, the common uh, thing people would say is, I've got all my eggs in one basket. So, and that's true, you know, you virtualized all your physical machines, you put them on virtual machines, now you've got them running on one server, let's say, and that server blows up, well, goodbye to all those VMs. Uh, again, uh, with VMware AHA, if you've got multiple host machines, if a host machine fails, uh, the other hosts in the cluster that survive can actually uh, take over the duties. Other words, uh, start up the VMs on there. So again, the VMs do go down uh, momentarily, but they're back up usually in a minute or so. VMware vMotion is a technology that allows us to move or migrate a virtual machine from one physical host to another physical host while the VM is running, you could actually be, that could be, let's say, my database server or my exchange server or whatever, and um, I could actually move it from that VM from one physical host over to another physical host you know, while the VM is running, and you know, I might drop a packet or something. So we talk about a, lo a lot of this stuff actually in the course. Storage vMotion, again, since a virtual machine is just a bunch of files, so they reside on, uh, on a volume. Uh, this volume is what we call a data store. So storage vMotion allows us basically to migrate from one data store to another. DRS, the distributed resource scheduler, this is a, a cluster that can balance the load um, of the host. So for example, if you've got a bunch of hosts in a cluster and one host is overloaded, he's doing a lot of work, he's got a bunch of VMs running on him, uh, a DRS cluster can actually utilize vMotion and migrate these uh, virtual machines to other hosts in the cluster to get a better performance. Storage DRS is very similar to VMware DRS, but this is from a storage perspective. So if one of my data stores is running out of space or getting a little low, we can move automatically move VMs around. And it's also done based on IOs per second as well. We talk about a lot of this stuff in the class. We've got the virtual machine file system, which we talk about in the class. This is VMware's proprietary file system. We talk about the VMware data recovery appliance. This is for like backing up VMs. This is one tool for backing up VMs. And VMware Update Manager, there's another little tool that we play around with in our classroom, and it allows us to do patch management of our ESXi hosts and various other things as well. But now, so these are all the different technologies that are, that are basically built in vSphere, and again, what's your license for it? We talk about licensing in the class. Now, down over here, they got this thing called vCenter Server. vCenter Server is kind of the, the, uh, the center of everything. Uh, basically, vCenter Server allows us to manage and monitor uh, multiple ESXi hosts. So this allows us to do centralized management. Also, vCenter Server is required to do a lot of these features up here, like HA and vMotion and storage vMotion, a lot of this higher-end stuff, vCenter Server is, uh, is required. So again, we talk about a lot of this stuff in the course, why it's important, how they're related to each other. Cloud. Can't go anywhere without talking about cloud now, can we? Um, Everybody has their little definition of cloud, which is fine. And I like to look at it as cloud is basically doing something on the internet or utilizing the internet for something. Um, one of the things that I kind of uh, like to compare it to is I'm a big Xbox 360 fan. I play, I play some video games whenever I get the chance. And back in February of this year, I believe it was, I noticed 
uh, they, uh, Microsoft made a change. So, for example, let's say I'm at home and I'm playing Xbox, and I want to save, you know, the, you know, my my status of the game or whatever the case may be. I actually use a USB stick. I got that plugged in my Xbox, and I save everything on a USB stick. Now, when I go to the cottage, yeah, I got a Xbox at the cottage too, folks. Right? Sometimes I work from up there. Uh, so, if I go to the cottage, I'll actually plug my USB stick into that uh, Xbox, and then I can continue on playing if I want to, right? So, uh, and I don't do this constantly, folks. But back in February, uh, Microsoft introduced something really cool. Um, Xbox Live basically now has cloud. So I can actually store the status of my games or my, the positions of my games in the cloud. So now, once my console gets a connection to the internet, boom, no problems. I can go over to any of my buddy's house if they got an Xbox and then actually um, continue my game from there if I want to. That's kind of their idea. But hey, we're talking about VMware, so let's get back to that. So first of all, VMware has this thing what they call a private cloud, and they've got another thing called a public cloud. So a private cloud basically is um, you're the customer. You own these physical servers. These are your physical servers. These are all your virtual machines. They run on top of your physical servers. You own the physical servers. You manage them. Uh, you look after everything. Okay, That's the private cloud. And that's what a lot of people did. They took all their physical servers. They reduced it down now to a, you know, a handful of servers. And they started playing with virtualization. So that was great. Then they said, OK, we need to save more, uh, more money. Uh, I know the Canadian government actually did this. So once they virtualized, once they virtualized everything, they got all their physical servers, they said, this VM and this VM, let's say, it's not really that sensitive. Why don't I find a provider, a hosting provider, and run my virtual machines on top of their hardware? So the public cloud basically is you're going to a vendor that's actually providing virtualization resources, and you'll take your VMs and run it on top of their hardware. You don't manage their hardware. You don't own it. You don't care about it. That's their job. They basically look after that. They look after their own data center. So a lot of customers will do this because, hey, it really saves them money because now we don't have to manage all these physical boxes still, and we can even reduce our power consumption even further. So you'll actually see a lot of people um, doing, uh, when they first get into virtualization, they're actually creating their own private cloud. Okay. Uh, once they've done that and they want to reduce cost even more, then they'll probably start looking at public cloud. And I know, again, the Canadian government's actually done this, right? Okay, this, uh, this part here talks about virtual desktop infrastructure. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but anyways, th the next logical step is when once you've virtualized all your servers and you, you know, is that basically it? You're all done? No, the actual next logical step would be the virtualized desktops. Um, everybody's probably heard, you know, terms like bring your own PC to work. Um, so you'll actually see companies uh, kind of going down the road uh, adopting this. But once they've got all their servers virtualized, it just makes sense to start virtualizing their desktops. So that's what we call virtual desktop infrastructure. VMware's got a product called VMware View, and they have separate classes on it. VMware View is a product that kind of sits beside, I like to say it sits beside vSphere. And it basically instructs vSphere to create VMs or destroy VMs based on you know what we want to do. So again, if I actually go to the next slide here, so virtualizing desktops, so my desktop will actually be a virtual machine. I can then run what they call thin clients. The advantage of thin clients is it's a real, it's like a terminal. It's like we're almost going back to the old days where you have terminals and mainframes, right? So you got these real dumb clients over here, these terminals that basically all they have is a keyboard, mouse, and, and a monitor, right? Some of them are like outlets that are built on the wall. There's no floppy or USB ports. There can be, right? So very, very dumb terminals, and they connect to their virtual machines and they're actually managed. So the advantage of doing that is you can actually now have your VMs are all central. You'll see this little bubble here. So this is my bubble in my data center, let's say. So my VMs do not leave my data center. A good example of that would be my laptop. Uh, my laptop has uh, various IBM information on it. Some of the stuff's encrypted, or most of it's encrypted. Uh, if I lost my laptop, potentially somebody could go in and basically retrieve that data. Well, they can't it's encrypt it. But anyways, it doesn't really matter. But you get kind of the idea. Um, so potentially somebody could do that. 
in a virtual desktop environment, the image doesn't leave the data center, so everything is secure over here. So that's a real advantage. Uh, there's also capabilities for, you know, sometimes you got to go out on the road. So again, you can actually sign out your images onto your laptop, let's say, or whatever the case may be. The beauty of this is, and where we see this really going, I know in the States, U.S. has really jumped on board. Canada, a little bit slower in the times when it comes to virtualizing desktops. I mean, we'll get there. Uh, you'll actually see a lot of companies doing this. It just makes sense. Uh, for example, again, if I relate IBM to this thing, IBM, we have thousands of users here in Canada, and most of them get a laptop. That's a big investment for IBM to make and manage those laptops. If something breaks on the laptop, they've got to have somebody in support to fix it send you out a new one with a new image. That's a lot of money. My prediction, what you'll see is companies basically say, no, 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 we're going to give you, here's a here's a, a one-time fee you know, of X amount of dollars. You go out and buy whatever tablet you want or laptop you want. You buy whatever you want to do your job. You own it. You're responsible for it. And here, you'll run our desktop image on top of that. So for example, I could today actually get an iPad and run a Windows desktop on top of it, it's run through VMware View. You'll actually see hospitals in the states doing that, where doctors are going from patient to patient, and everything's accessed on their iPads, and um, which is really cool when you think about it. So I really see this uh, taken off. It just makes sense. Here's the next th screen. They talk about the benefits of virtual desktops. Okay, I can, I'll, I'll let you uh, kind of read that. But again, the same kind of advantages to virtualization. Also, I have my images are all central. It makes it easier for me for patch management, all kinds of stuff. Uh, here they talk about VCT certification. So VMware's got different certification programs out. Um, and again, more information can be found at this VMware link. So these are the courses that we teach are actually authorized uh, VMware classes. So uh, I usually get a bunch of students that when they come into the class, they are actually looking at getting certified as a VMware certified professional, the VCP. So that's the first level of certification. So again, we'll talk about, a bit about that in our install and configure and manage course. This slide here basically goes through and talks about the different courses. Uh, these are the course codes. So the very first one is the vSphere Install, Configure, and Manage is the five-day course. Uh, that's the course I recommend to people that if you don't even know how to spell VMware, that's the course to take, right? Um, so we start right from ground zero, and by the time you come out of that class, you should be fairly comfortable with the product. Here's the fast track. Uh, the fast track is basically a five-day extended hours, okay? That's from eight in the morning to six at night. It's basically everything that we cover in the Install, Configure, Manage course, plus some extra stuff that we actually do in here. So some more advanced stuff, a little bit on scripting, uh, very little bit on scripting, uh, stuff on distributed switches, etc. So there's an extra stuff here. Uh, this can get be uh, a little intense for those who are a little uh, timid or a little bit new to virtualization, but again, another option that's available. There's the What's New course, that's a two-day course. Uh, that's basically for people that are already um, familiar with VMware uh, vSphere 4 and they just want to find out what's new with version 5. So again, you have to already know what you're doing when you take this class. Uh, the VMware View, that's the virtual desktop. Uh, again, I tell people you need to have the understanding of this course or these two courses here before you can jump into VMware View. So you need to understand vSphere before you do View. So here's the View course. There is the uh, Site Recovery Manager course that's actually new. This is more of an advanced course for protecting data centers. There's the design course as well. Some of these are all new. There's the vCloud course. Uh, and these are some of the older troubleshooting. You'll notice it's on version 4. Uh, the troubleshooting to me, if you know how to troubleshoot version 4, you know how to troubleshoot version 5. But um, again, these courses are still available. I understand VMware is currently in the process of upgrading or updating these. Now, I heard they might combine these two together. Uh, into one course. Again, we don't know that for sure. Uh, we'll have to wait. I hear that they're coming out sometime this summer uh, with some of these courses. So we'll just wait and see. But these are still available for those students that want to take it. Now, uh, we have different formats uh, for delivery. Uh, we can actually offer public classes. That's what basically what we do. So anybody can sign up for it. Uh, we also offer private classes. Private classes, again, you know, a group of people for one company. Uh, we also do professional certifica certification and ILO, instructor led online. So we're able to deliver these things via the web, sort of like what we're doing right now on this little presentation. 
Under private training, so is private training with IBM is the best way for your team to quickly and effectively get your skills you need. Uh, one of the things with private training that I try to, if, if we get into a uh, situation where a customer wants private training, I try to find a little bit of background about the customer, try to find out what their environment is. This way I can kind of try uh, and, and tailor the courses to their environment, right? Uh, it says IBM will customize your classes to, specific, uh, to specifically meet your training needs. And I've put that little thing here, certain limitations apply. Uh, depending on your courses, usually VMware courses, we don't really get a, uh, we're not really allowed to do any serious customization, let's say. Uh, but what we can do here, and that's why I put certain limitations apply, is if we get a customer that wants to take some VMware training and they do want a little bit of customization, we'll have to deal with that on a, uh, a, a per customer basis. Uh, we had a customer once that basically they didn't want to do the course in five days, they wanted to do it in four days. That's not a problem. Uh, we would just basically, you know, we'd do working lunches or extended days or whatever the case may be. So stuff like that we can actually do. We could probably combine a couple of courses together in a shorter time. But again, we'll have to take that one on a per uh, uh, incident basis. Private classes uh, can be at your customer site or at IBM training centers or CTC. Okay. Um, one of the things there, sorry about that, folks. My little alarm went off. One of the things that I like to actually point out. Uh, with private classes. A lot of times if you do it at a customer's location, sometimes, and I've seen this, experienced it in the past, uh, the students um, really may get pulled out of the classroom to do their daily work, and I've seen that happen a few times. So I'm usually not the biggest fan of private classes at a customer's site, um, but again, hey, we're all for it as long as you know, we all know what, you know what we can get out of it. Since all courses can be delivered as private sessions, and discount pricing is available. Again, you know, and since your skilled instructors and extensive hands-on labs create a powerful learning environment. Again, again, some of the classes there, most of the classes actually have hands-on labs and stuff, so the, the users are actually playing with the, with the software. Uh, here are some of the classes that we currently have uh, coming. So uh, we've got some, uh, uh, this is actually uh, May, 5th, uh, May 14th, is already run in Markham and Halifax. Then we have uh, Edmonton coming up. Uh, over here, I just want to point out, so these are some of the courses that we have, the dates that are coming up and the course titles and stuff. Just this GTR up here, that's guaranteed to run. So you'll see a list of them here that have been guaranteed to run. So uh, if you want to sign up and then you can get some more in the summer. There's a bunch more after August. They only just put, basically put up to August here. Okay. And I know once you've seen all that stuff, the next question that's burning in your mind is how do I sign up or how do I register? Well, there's two ways. You can email learn at traincanada.com or you can call 1-800-699-4007. Operators are standing by right now. So I hope you found this session useful. Um, hope uh, that you um, basically um, see some use of the courses and stuff and, uh, and get signed up. And thank you very much. And uh, thanks for your time and have a good day.